This is what it is, okay? I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now, you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now, water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Now, today we're going to talk about Buddhism. Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism. You could, in a way, call it a reform of Hinduism, or Hinduism stripped for export. It originates in northern India, close to the area that is now Nepal, shortly after 600 BC. There was a young prince by the name of Gotama Siddhartha who became the man we call the Buddha. Now the word Buddha is not a proper name, it's a title. And it's based on the Sanskrit root Buddha, B-U-D-H, which means to be awake. And so you could say the Buddha is the man who woke up from the dream of life as we ordinarily take it to be and found out who he was, who he is. It's curious that uh, this title was not something new. There was already in the whole complex of Hinduism the idea of Buddhas, of uh, awakened people. And curiously, they are ranked higher than gods. Because in the view of Hinduism, even the gods, or the angels, the devas, are still bound on the wheel of the, uh, the sort of squirrel cage of going round and round and round in the pursuit of success. And the idea is that if you pursue something that you can call success, pleasure, good, virtue, which originally of course means strength, magical power, all these positive things. You are under illusion because the positive cannot exist without the negative. To be, you only know what to be is by contrast with not to be. So if we say, now, uh, there is a coin in the left hand, there is no coin in the right. And from this you get the idea of to be and not to be. And you can't have the one without the other. So if you try to pursue, to gain the positive, and to deny, get rid of the negative, it's as if you were trying to arrange everything in this room so that it was all up and nothing was down. You can't do it. You set yourself an absolutely insoluble problem. Because the basis of life is spectrum. Now consider the spectrum of colors. When you think of a spectrum, in what form do you think of it? Most people think of it as a ribbon, with red at one end and purple at the other. But the spectrum is actually a circle. Because purple is the mixture of red and blue. It goes right round. And so in this way, all sensation, all feeling, all experience whatsoever is moving through spectra. You don't only have the spectrum of color, you have a spectrum of sound, 
you have various complex spectra of texture, of smell, of taste, and you're constantly operating through all the possible variations of experience. And it implies that you can't know one end of the spectrum without also knowing the other. So if you wanted, if say your favorite color is red, and you wanted only red, and you had to exclude, therefore, blue and purple. Without blue and purple, you can't have red. Behind, of course, all the various colors in the spectrum is the white light. And behind everything that we experience, all our various sensations of sound, of color, of shape, of touch, there's the white light. And I'm using the phrase, the white light, <coughs> rather symbolically. I don't mean it literally. But there is common to all sensations what you might call the basic sense. And if you explore back into your sensations and reduce them all to the basic sense, you're on your way to reality to what underlies everything, to what is the ground of being, the basic energy. And to the extent that you realize this and know that you are it, you transcend, you overcome, you surpass the illusion that you are simply John Doe, Mary Smith, or what have you. So then, uh, the Buddha, as the man who woke up, is regarded as one Buddha among a potentiality of myriads of Buddhas. Everybody can be a Buddha. Everybody has in himself the capacity to wake up from the illusion of being simply this separate individual. The Buddha made his doctrine very easy to understand because in those days there wasn't very much writing being done and people committed things to memory and so he put his doctrine or method in various formulae which are very easy to remember and I'm going to explain it in those terms so that you can remember it just as well he of course practiced the various disciplines that were offered in the Hinduism of his time. But he found in a certain way that they had become unsatisfactory. Because they had overemphasized asceticism. Had overemphasized putting up with as much pain as you can. There was a feeling, you see, that if the problem of life is pain, let, let us suffer. And this is the root of the ascetics, you see, who lie on beds of nails, who hold a hand up forever and ever and ever, who eat only one banana a day, who uh, renounce sex, who uh, do all these weird things, because they feel that if they head right into pain and don't become afraid of it, but suffer as much pain as possible, they will, by this method, overcome the problem of pain. And they will set themselves free from anxiety. There's a certain sense in that, as you can obviously see. Supposing, for example, you have absolutely no fear of pain. You have no anxieties. You have no hang-ups. How strong you would be. Nobody could stop you. You would have ultimate courage. But the Buddha was very subtle. He is really the first historical psychologist, the great psychologist, psychotherapist. He is very subtle because he saw that a person who is fighting pain, who is trying to get rid of pain, is still really fundamentally afraid of it. And therefore, the way of asceticism, 
is not right. Equally, the way of hedonism, of seeking pleasure, is not right. So the Buddha's doctrine is called the middle way, which is neither ascetic nor hedonistic. So it's summed up in what are called the four noble truths. You're late. A wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. So.